Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Thompson. Uh, I'm the uh, program lead uh, for teaching, learning and assessment in JISC's advice team, but uh, that's not important right now. Uh, thank you for choosing this uh, session, this afternoon session. Um, uh, it's two sessions of half an hour. In um, half an hour's time, we'll be handing over to Anne Charlotte, who's going to be talking to us about Staffordshire University's uh, approach to upskilling, uh, roadmap for upskilling staff. Um, but before that, uh, I'm happy to introduce you to uh, Samantha Stark and Simon Carey of the University of Leeds, uh, who are going to be talk to, talking to us about uh, design frameworks. Um, as with all the previous sessions beforehand, there will be an opportunity for Q&A um, at the end of each session. So we'll, we'll go for 20 minutes or so, have some Q&A, and then we'll swap over for, for Anshul's session. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to get out of your way, and it's all yours. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along to this session. Uh, I hope you're, uh, you're gonna find it useful. Um, what Samantha and I uh, would like to do today is just give you a bit of an overview of a bit of a project that we've gone through at the University of Leeds. Um, as a, an online learning team, we design and develop uh, fully online master's modules um, at postgraduate level and um, this is a piece of work that we've done as a large team, and Samantha and I are here today to explain a little bit about it. Um, so uh, the first part, I'm gonna talk about the process we went through to design the framework, uh, a little bit around the challenges, why we wanted to do this, and how we went through the process and what the output was, and I'll explain that. And then I'm gonna hand over to Samantha, who's gonna tell you a bit about how we implemented that and the evaluation work that Samantha in particular has done around the framework. So um, in, in terms of the design framework itself, um, we have been developing modules for quite some time. Um, and the approach that we've taken has been very much led by the individual learning designer who has taken their, what they uh, think is a good design process and have taken academics through that to design and develop the modules. But we found as we've scaled and we are growing uh, quite a lot and developing more and more programs that we are starting to get a lot of inconsistency in the programs um, from module to module because different modules have different academics and different learning designers. And that's creating an experience for students which is a bit inconsistent and they find they're finding they're having difficulties with that. From the academic perspective, working with different learning designers gives them different experiences um, and uh, those experiences vary a lot. And it's like starting with a blank sheet approach and that's something that they've found quite difficult. So we thought perhaps by introducing and creating a framework for how we design the modules themselves, that would help to um, scaffold the process for the academics so that they, um, they don't have to start with a blank sheet of paper. They've got some sort of rules or framework they can work within. Uh, we'll be sharing these slides afterwards, so I'm not going to go through everything on them, but uh, you'll, you can see some of the other challenges we've had along the way. Uh, so in order to start this framework, we needed to think about what, uh, what we want the student experience to be. So before going into designing a framework, what we did is we came up with the design philosophy. That design philosophy um, is about how we what we're creating for students and the process that we want to go through to create them. So you can see we want to create learner-centered experience, uh, active learning, um, and compelling learning journeys, and also very importantly, part of the process of creating master's modules is that the academics have some resources that they can reuse afterwards. So that reuse is a really important part of what we, what we do. And the approach, we want to be collaborative, uh, we want to innovate and we want to use people's time uh, as effectively as possible because um, as all of you know academics can be very very busy people so we want to make the process as useful for them as possible so once we had that design philosophy in place then we went through a design process and that's where i brought together the team of learning designers um, who brought together their ideas of what they thought a module framework should include some of the pedagogical ideas behind it, the theories, brought those together in a workshop setting, and then we created a framework. And I'm going to explain that to you in a moment or two. But just to say, once we'd created that initial framework, we then reviewed it internally within the digital education service at Leeds, and then we took it out to the academics and got their input as well. Those are academics who've worked with us before and have experience of 
online masters, fully online masters programs. And through that feedback, we've prototyped uh, and iterated it. So here are some of the uh, some of the major influences. I'm sure you'll uh, be familiar with uh, with a lot of them. Obviously, these are um, postgraduate levels, so we need to have, make sure we've got constructive alignment. Students are working towards that final summative assessment. Uh, Laurel Ard's conversational framework is something that we've used an awful lot at the University of Leeds, particularly in the early days when we were making MOOCs. But we've seen that come through um, as a really useful tool for the learning designers, but also a really useful tool for the academics because it helps them to make sense of the different types of interactions that students can have. Um, something called Curriculum Redefined, which is a new uh, university-wide um, initiative at the University of Leeds, which is about bringing digital into uh, as much teaching and learning as possible. Uh, so that very much influenced us. And I'm going to skip down to the bottom because one of the major um, theories that we brought in is around situated learning theory and actually making the learning for students as authentic as possible. Because it's at master's level, most of the students that we have uh, onto the programmes are professionals. They have been out of um, education for some time, usually they're time poor. So what we want to do is make sure that we're creating a learning experience for them that they can immediately take away and take back to the workplace or to their own context. Uh, so that's very much uh, underpinned the, uh, the framework that we, that we have. So if I can uh, just give you a quick overview, a bit of context about how the framework works. The uh, modules that we have within programs take place over an eight week period. So they are very condensed. Uh, that's 150 hours potentially of learning in eight weeks. The students over each week, they have six core units. Uh, so six over six weeks in each unit, each week, they do 20 hours of learning. Then in the final week for, with the revision assessment, they've got potentially 30 hours to revise and do their final assessment before they have a week's break and move into the following module. So it's really condensed. Um, and each, as I say, each week is 20 hours. So how we've broken that 20 hours down is we've got two 10 hour blocks, as it were. This is what we, uh, how we'd like the academics to think about it. We've got the 10 hour block that they work very much with the digital education service to create. Um, and that's around guided tasks. So your kind of input, your lecture type material, um, completing exercises and activities, doing some uh, core reading, watching videos, interactives, things like that. There's also the webinars, the synchronous time. We have synchronous time each week, and there's also the asynchronous time as well. And that's where the bulk of the time spent with uh, digital education service to create resources comes. We also have the other 10 hours of learning, which is the more uh, master's level learner guided. They're creating it and putting it in their own context. They're doing their own reading, their own research, preparing for assessments. So I just want to take a moment to focus on the, the tutor guided learning, that 10 hours. This is where the framework really comes into play. So we've taken that 10 hours and we've broken it down into three kind of core sections. And that's really as much of a framework as it is. We have the first section, which is the prepare, which is normally two hours of input. So you might find your lecture type material there. And that leads on to the apply section. And this is where I said the scenario based learning comes in. Each unit has a uh, central task or a central activity that students uh, that students complete, and that has a, a clear goal at the end. Students um, work through that task using the information, the learning, the knowledge that they've acquired in the prepare section. And then they move on to the reflection at the end, which is typically where they'll find their synchronous time with the academic and um, where they can do some reflection. And in between that, there's time for, thank you, uh, time for their discussion either before the task or after the task, depending what, uh, what makes the most sense. So that's the, that's the framework. We implemented this about a year ago, and I'm gonna pass over to Samantha, she's gonna tell you a bit more about that. Yes, so hello everyone. Implementation and evaluation. So 
We are now using this framework for all of the masters that uh, we're designing, but we started off by piloting it on two different master's degree programs. The first was our master's in sustainable business leadership, and we um, piloted it on the business analytics module. And we also piloted it on the international fashion marketing um, degree on the two modules that you can see listed there. I'm gonna call these SBL and IFM, these master's degrees, because the titles are too long. Um, and then we um, use them for all the remaining modules on IFM. And then we um, then used it for all of the modules on our MA in Digital Design and Communication, DDC for short. And I'm about to start using it on um, Precision Medicine and uh, my colleagues are using it on a data science um, degree. But initially we were just piloting it on these three modules. Um, so, as part of the pilot, I applied for funding um, to do research and I got funding from the Leeds Institute of Teaching Excellence or LIGHT for short. And they funded me for one year, one day a week um, from September last year. And the purpose of the research was to find out is the framework actually working? Um, you know, we think it's great, but it might not be achieving what we want it to achieve. Um, does it need to be approved, improved in any way? Um, and just to get that feedback basically. Um, so I started uh, in September last year, so I started with my ethics application, and then data collection was a bit delayed um, due to module delays, um, data analysis started in July, so I'm still in coming to the end of data collection, um, analyzing data and disseminating all at the same time, um, so the um, initial findings are not, are not complete, but it's what I've found so far for my initial data analysis. Um, so I collected data from everybody who is impacted by this, basically. So I collected data from DES stands for the Digital Education Service. That's who we work for within the University of Leeds. So I collected data from um, my colleagues. I collected data from academics um, and I also collected data from students. And importantly, I've been collecting data about from about models that do use the framework and also that don't use the framework so that I can kind of compare what people's experiences are and see if there's any trends um, in relation to either framework or non-framework modules. So I did two focus groups with their staff. I've done one-to-one -one interviews with academics, so seven so far, and I've done an online anonymous questionnaire with students. Um, unfortunately, I've only had six responses so far because they are time poor, unfortunately, but at least I do have some insight from them. Um, so I'm going to go through now what my initial findings are, and there are positives and negatives um, from, from all sides, basically. So in relation to um, DES staff, um, you'll see there are some points in bold, and those are the consistent themes that appear throughout all the data. So DES staff, academics, and potentially students as well. So that clear structure is um, clearly a big positive in relation to the framework. And uh, my colleagues have also found that having that framework helps their discussions with academics because it gives them a platform upon which they can start talking about online pedagogy because it has there is that framework there rather than having the kind of blank sheet approach. So that helps um, in that respect. Um, it prevents um, too high a volume of materials being created. And that was one of the big reasons that we created the framework in the first place, because we were just drowning under the um, amount of materials we had to um, deal with. Um, the application to real life scenarios, so learning is more meaningful, um, and they generally prefer framework to non framework. There's a lot of negative though. <laughs> um, so it, there's difficulties with, with um, working with academics because often they're looking at the phases, the prepare, the apply, the reflect as three distinct phases that are isolated rather than culminating in uh, one learning experience. Um, and there are issues about, you know, how the academics want to approach. We're saying they have to do the apply section first because the prepare section can't be designed until you know what the apply section is going to be. But um, some of them just want to start at the beginning and go through it chronologically, which um, does create challenges. Um, a big note in bold is good task design takes a lot of time and skill, which means the framework may not help to speed up the design process because to create a good apply phase, you have to do a lot of thinking, a lot of resource, resource finding, etc. Um, there was also criticism of the prepare phase being mostly passive learning and not active enough. 
um, and that it does not work for all disciplines. So that was also a key theme. So academic staff, uh, again, we've got this clear narrative structure um, and it's the, the consistency is good. Um, there's now a reduced number of discussions in the blank sheet approach that we had before. There would have been multiple discussions in a week. There were issues with student engagement. Um, there were disagreements as to how many discussions there should be. Um, I had one module where the academic wanted a certain number of discussions. The peer reviewer said there should be more and the program lead said there should be fewer. So I had three different views all in one go and I was I didn't know what to do with it. So at least with this, it kind of removes that issue. And it's just that one substantive discussion, which is good. And also that the inquisitorial approach to reading is good. So because the prepare phase is only two hours, they may do a lot of their reading in the apply phase, which means they are reading for a purpose because they're reading in order to complete a specific task or activity rather than just being told to read something and just read it with no potentially no purpose. Um, Lots of criticism, though, and that's fair enough. Um, flexibility is key. And to be fair, the framework should be applied flexibly. But it could well have been that when we were piloting it, we stuck to it quite rigidly. Um, and that's not what academics want. And it doesn't necessarily work for all disciplines. And that brings to the next negative point that it doesn't work for all disciplines. For example, in some disciplines, the answer is right or wrong. There is no discussion. There is no reflection. It just is. It's just fact. So I think now that we've used the framework a bit more, we can be a bit more confident about ditching certain things if it doesn't work for that particular discipline. A big thing is that it only works if learners are motivated to do the task. If they don't do the apply phase, they miss out on a huge amount of their learning and they may skip it. Um, so that means that we need to design in a way that's going to motivate them to do it. Um, limited engagement in discussion forums. This could be an issue with workload. And this relates to some of the student feedback. So there are caveats with the student feedback. Um, it's difficult to find trends due to the low response rate and small cohorts. Um, many of our master's degrees are quite new and it can take a while to build up the size of the cohorts. Um, and also the feedback may be more to do with a specific module. So the students didn't know if they'd done a framework or non-framework module. They've just done a module and that was it. And when I collected data from them, I didn't tell them which one it was because I didn't want that to influence the research. So there are a few caveats with the student data. Um, but there were some issues about them feeling there was insufficient talk content on framework um, modules. But equally on a non-framework, they felt that exercises didn't relate to the assessment enough. High workload. So one person said it was there was a high workload. It was too much for them to do. But again, this could be to do with their familiarity with the topic um, and also that there was just too much going on. So the tasks, there's discussions, there's feedback. And so um, they felt that maybe fewer tasks or shorter tasks would be helpful for them so that they can actually go through things pop properly and participate as they wish. So this may be why, you know, discussion engagement has been quite low because students are not going to prioritize it. They're going to prioritize the learning materials. They're going to prioritize the webinar um, and they may not prioritize that. So. There's lots for us to learn from this, basically. So there are a few improvements um, we can make. Um, so, yeah, having the confidence to adjust the framework according to the discipline. So I think now that we've used it a bit more, maybe we've got more confident, we can be a bit more flexible with it and talk to the academics about what works in their discipline and adjust the framework accordingly. Um, perhaps make the pair phase a little bit more active. Um, this may then help to link it better to the apply phase. Maybe they've done a bit of practice that's guided before they're sent off to do their kind of apply phase more independently. Um, more flexibility in relation to the size of the tasks. Um, so maybe reduce the size or if there's a bigger task to reduce the workload elsewhere. Um, and to provide that motivation, but also to improve academic onboarding, because there were some issues with how academics are approaching the design in relation to the framework. So perhaps we need to improve that onboarding so they understand a bit more about why we're doing it in this way, and why the apply phase has to be done first, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the initial findings. Um, I think we've learned a lot um, from the process so far, um, and hopefully in the future, we'll be able to learn more from applying it to, to more disciplines. Um, so yeah, these are our references. And yeah, any questions? Looks like we're within time as well. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see under the hood of how it's working at the single institution. Um, yes, we saw. So, how do you deal with Genex wanting to throw everything out of the kitchen sink into a module, and have you convinced them that maybe this is more in some cases? Yeah, it's really hard um, when some of them say, what, two hours? We can't possibly do everything in two hours. <laughs> and then that is something that they have struggled with. Um, but the framework at least give, it gives some kind of container, first of all, whereas previously with the bank blank page, the students were just drowning and under it. So at least this gives some kind of a, a limit. But I think this also comes down more to academic onboarding and helping them to understand the pedagogy because the read a lot of the reading will come in with that apply phase it's just like you're, you're just giving them an overview you're giving them an introduction you're giving them the tools you're not expected to cover everything in two hours but you should do enough that when they come to that actual apply phase they feel that okay i know what they need but they will need to do further reading they will need to do further research in order to do it properly so i think it's about explaining that that side of things but yeah it's a challenge for sure <laughs> Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. When what, said, what, 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 do you, what do you think? No, I'm asking you. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I didn't. I didn't think ABC was a was an actual uh, framework to design within like a certain number of hours. It can be. It can be. Okay. Um, that's how we use it in the classroom. I use the design classroom for breaking learning into the types, not the same learning types, right? Mm. But um, that's why I was curious how might it relate or how it's different. Yeah, I'll have to have a look. I'll have a look not to say that it's worse, but to clarify when I go back, like mm. taking this back, how it's different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the process isn't necessarily, you know, we're not introducing any groundbreaking, pet, we, know, we know that it's more about how we've adapted it to online, how we're adapting it to different disciplines and the results of the research into it as to how it's being received. But we're not trying to like introduce anything like absolutely new, yeah. Um, before I come to you, uh, you had your hand up, was like, yeah, just a quick comment as someone who was involved in the genesis of the ABC. Uh, the, the, yeah, it, it was, ABC was never intended to be cover the full design process, but it's it works very well as a, the initial quick fire uh, rough prototyping of uh, module structure or whole structure. But then um, you obviously have to uh, get involved in other methods, uh, but you can still take the learning types forward. And this is, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, quite a big influence in your overall framework anyway to make learning active yeah, yeah i mean it's, it, that's something that the the learning designers use with the with the academics they're always talking about the type of learning and trying to mix that up and making the academics aware of um basically not just acquire and lots of other types which is where the apply phase really comes in it's the the, the task is all, often to produce something uh, yes, Jonathan, but I would be really honest, actually. Uh, in addition to learning design, can learning design they can evolve, become ABC to those like uh, uh, VLE, right? And all you have is their own framework to start their, their online courses. Um, I'm impressed by your evaluation and your presentation by uh, approach you apply for a uh, It will be useful to, before you even <laughs> develop your own grid, framework, uh, would be useful to compare what is already available and different from work. I mean, I'm interested in this area if you mm. are able to. Now, even now, you click on your uh, your uh, framework and compare with the others and the pull the and the mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely scope for us to research more about other people, how other people are approaching it, and, and certainly how the students have received it as well. I think it'd be really interesting. Got a question and somebody else to have it. Um, did you find out, because you said you're still analyzing the data, that these differences between the disciplines can you give us a sense of uh, science not like this? And, uh, 
Money keys in general, like that, or vice versa. Yeah, so I think it, it's um, for so from the pilot models, business analytics, it was like we don't have anything to discuss, we don't have anything to reflect on. Either your code is right or your code is wrong, that is it. So for them, it, it, the structure really worked because that's how they would do it face to face. So the academic was like, yep, yeah, it was fine, I could adapt to it because it worked. You know, you give them some prep work to do and then they actually do the coding and they do that kind of thing. And then they kind of have a look at it afterwards. But he said the reflect really came when you've done your code and then you talk to somebody else about your code. And you think, OK, well, how did this work? But there's no real reflection, really. Whereas in more humanities based or design based subjects where there's lots of, you know, there's lots of differing opinions, there's different cultural influences, stuff like that. There's a lot more to discuss and reflect upon. So those are the examples that we have so far. For my precision medicine uh, masters that I'm about to start designing, yeah, we're probably not going to bother <laughs> with any of like the reflection and the discussion because I can tell it's just not part of the pedagogy. And I think that's really what it's, it's whether or not there are gray areas, whether or not there are, are moral issues where people can get engaged with those sorts of reflections and, and discussions. And it's those parts of the framework really that are gonna vary depending on the discipline, I think. I just wonder, we have a structure and what the university is going to do that structure is in certain areas one at a time. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I have one. It's a bit more philosophical than uh, this one's, but uh, I thought, were you in for the, the keynote this morning from Anne Marie? Yeah, yeah. She was alluding to um, some of the political tensions about online learning that she's experienced in Canada. I mean, there's, a, there's a bit of a narrative going on at the moment about the second class nature of online, the online learning experience. And I just kind of wondered what your take on that was, whether you feel that that narrative has any impact on the structure that you have at the university of the way that you built the framework. Uh, I think it uh, it really varies who you're who you're talking to. Yeah. So um, you know some I don't want to make a broad generalizations, but it depends who you talk to. Some some colleagues that we work with are absolutely on board with this. Um, you can take it to them, and they can see the value straight away. Um, others are more well. This is the way I do it, um, and you just want to take it and just put it online. Um, so, you know, in terms of uh, what Anne Marie's talking about, I think, you know, um, yeah, it just it depends who you, it depends who you talk to. Some some academics can see that the 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 focus that the university has to do more online is going to be a good thing. Others, not so much. And does it affect the, the students that are on the master's courses as well? Do they have does that does that come across all in your research? Not yet. Yeah, it hasn't yet. I think it's, I think for, for the students, this is the only way they're going to be able to study because they've got so many other commitments. I wasn't in the keynote this morning because I was very delayed on my drive down. So I'm kind of just guessing. Yeah, <laughs> I'll have a look. Yeah. <laughs> any, any okay. But you, you're saying in some subject areas that the scope for reflection and discussion is limited. I'm very surprised at that because even if you're talking about neurosurgery, right, there are points that you need to discuss. And surely the point of discussion is not opinions, it's absorption of what you need to learn. Do you, you see what I mean? So I thought yeah. that's, that's pretty black and white. I mean, I've an engineering track, right? Um, you're not going to argue that you know it's cold as hot, or whatever, right? But it, it helps to say, oh, look, here's a case study, and here's a reflection on this, and here's. I'm just surprised that you're getting a difference in that area. I think it's more to do with the fact that the after they've done an apply phase and they've done something, there's something to discuss, right? They're talking about what they've done and there is that space for it within the apply phase. They do the task and then there's like the sharing of your outcome. So they have to share their outcome with their colleagues and potentially with their tutor so they can get feedback and they can discuss that and then they can reflect on their work. It's more about the specific, okay, now let's discuss something specific that may help you prepare for the task. It may help to reflect on it. It's more those sort of additional discussions and reflections that we've had kind of resistance to in those sorts of subjects but when it's to do with the actual apply phase then they're up for it and there's more engagement excellent <laughs>
Lots of brilliant answers. How can we show our appreciation for coming?